my name is Giles Delevigny. I'm part of the Liga Sites team and just want to extend a very warm welcome uh, this evening. This is our 13th lecture uh, in the series and it's very nice to see some old faces and um, lots of new ones as well. So, art and architecture. Uh, somebody said to me last week, go on Giles, get concrete blocks into art. And um, I have to admit, it's been something of a challenge. I'm actually very quickly going to talk about some more recent innovations and collaboration. About 10 years ago, we started looking for other materials. And one of the materials that uh, was about was glass. And I thought it would be a lovely idea to produce a modern stained glass window type out of recycled glass. So we made a block of 100% recycled glass with some white cement. And then we tried cutting it very, very uh, finely so that if it was put up in a building, the light would come flooding through and it would look stunning. Didn't work, of course, like most good ideas. But what did happen was that Alex Dereich from DRMM came along to look at our wood, fell in love with our glass blocks, and as a result, at the time, his practice were working on one of the projects for the, Olymp for the Olympic um, Village. And uh, after about seven iterations, we ended up with a beautiful green uh, glass bit of masonry bedded in limestone and then planished. And we then had to go out and source the glass. And now the the point of the story really is that we've continued with a very close collaboration with the RMM and we've been involved with them on a number of projects over the last 10 years. This was, I think, the next project, which was uh, in Blackpool. And obviously, we have the sea behind. So again, glass in a block, in a Roman brick format. And clearly, they've stepped it in and out here. And then we've got what looks almost like uh, a clinker sort of prow of a ship again on the seafront. Because it was Blackpool uh, and this is a registry office, they wanted a little bit of bling. And so what we did was we put luminescent powder coated glass into this product. And so during the day, the sun warms it up. And then at night, when it gets dark, it gently glows. More recently, uh, at Rathbone Market, we've worked very closely with Adam West of CZWG. And again, for them, we produced a completely unique block that had never been made before from the flint from our quarry, and again, some glass. They wanted something very robust and tough at ground level uh, that would take a good battering in that part of London. So whether it is a crematorium, uh, and this is Crown Hill Crematorium in Milton Keynes, uh, designed by Adrian Morrow, who is here. And I, I think it's worth saying, I think this is the most beautifully and carefully detailed building we've ever supplied masonry to. It is an absolutely stunning building. Or a Sikh temple, this one in Leamington Spa. This was um, built five or six years ago. It was entirely paid for by the congregation. There are to check my notes, 340 different specials that they wanted on this building, and it, it looks completely stunning. A project we didn't work on, unfortunately, uh, is St. Martin and Fields, but I'm sure will come up um, in this presentation. So really the point I'm trying to make is whether, whatever the building is, we are very interested in innovation, we're very uh, interested in working with you in collaboration when we can. We have four um, Bs in Lignocyte, and they are uh, beautiful, bespoke British buildings. And that's what we very much passionately believe in and want to be involved in. So that is my very, uh, hopefully, brief introduction. And now we're going to do the proper stuff and come on to our main speakers. So Eric Parry doesn't really need uh, much of an introduction, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background. He studied architecture at Newcastle University and the Royal College of Art and the Architectural Association. He established Eric Parry Architects in 1983, the same year he was appointed lecturer in architecture at Cambridge, 
where he taught for 14 years. In 2006, he was elected to the Royal Academy. He and his team have developed a reputation for delivering beautifully crafted and well-considered buildings. London has been the focus for much of his work, and he is the mastermind behind one undershaft, if I got that right. Um, not knowing much about one undershaft, I talked to one of the members of his practice when I was there last week, and this is, and I quote what he said. He said, oh yes, yes, that's a building with a rude name that keeps going up and down. And I think what he meant was that it started life at 270 meters, it then rose to 304 meters, and I think now has settled back at 294.6 meters. I'm not sure, Eric is not looking convinced by any of this, but anyway, <laughs> I, I understand it will have 73 floors, it will be the tallest building in the city, and the second tallest building in London. So in addition to his work in architectural practice, he serves on the Kettles Yard Committee, the Canterbury Cathedral Fabric Advisory Committee, the Mayor's Design Advisory Panel, the Council of British School at Rome, and is an Architecture Foundation trustee. There's actually a lot more stuff, but I really didn't think I could um, say it all. So I'm going to move swiftly on to Vivian Lovell, who is the founder director of Modus Operandi, and also has a great number of letters after her name. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and an on Freeba. And I, you of course know what an on Freeba is. I didn't know what an on Freeba was, so I went online last night to have a look. And um, the first entry was actually for Freeba chips. And I'm pleased to tell you that they are available from Scotch Frost of Glasgow Limited. And they come in large, extra large, and simply enormous proportions. <laughs> Nothing to do with being an on freever, however. Vivian founded Modus Operandi in 1999 as an independent consultancy. She has championed the field of art in the public realm since the late 70s. Hard to believe. Uh, she has been involved in generating many collaborative projects between artists, architects, and other design professionals. And as well as her interest in chips and all things Italian, she is currently chair of the Faculty of Fine Arts in Rome. They are both uh, unbelievably busy folk, and I am very pleased and grateful that they've given up time to come and speak to us this evening. So, uh, well, actually, it, it fills me a, a huge amount of pleasure to be standing next to Vivian doing this um, uh, because it lends the other half, in a way, to uh, a conversation which I think should be very much part of uh, the normal <coughs> routine. Imagine a world stripped of the hieroglyphs on obelisks or, you know, um, of, of the contemporary sculpture that we we uh, cherish actually around cities um, in a world now I think that's kind of pretty de denuded so you know I just think that thank you I've dragged four memories from the past and passions have to start somewhere and this one was as a four or five year old on a family holiday in Bexhill on sea where the enormous ship of a building, the Delaware Pavilion, was between the little hotel where we used to stay and the sea. So it was there as this enormous <coughs> landmark and featured very largely in my childhood. And running through this amazing building, I'd come across this Edward Wadsworth mural, which has been restored recently. So the relationship of art to architecture, before I even knew what real art and real architecture was, was kind of imprinted very early on. Seeing an early important example post-Second World War of art in relation to architecture, art for architecture. I just want to quote from Henry Moore, who wrote at the time, I think architecture is the poorer for the absence of sculpture. And I also think that sculptor, by not collaborating with the architect, misses opportunities of his work being used socially 
and being seen by a wider public. And I desperately wanted a release which um, seemed to me to be the, uh, the, the entree for the potential collaboration between artist and architect. And I chose, against the very uh, rigorous organization of horizontal and vertical, uh, Joel Shapiro. And it took six years to get this uh, sculpture in place through two ownerships um, and an extraordinary sort of uh, passage. But if the stone is cut and, and uh, having made, for instance, with the Pembroke College, more than 20 visits to quarries and mines to establish what quarry was. Here it was given as Portland, but there was an incredible battle to actually es establish, again, on this, lintels of a single piece here. So the joint is absolutely critical. Led to a very a, a brilliant moment of his, that is to say that the exposed cheeks would be white. Um, uh, giving the lie to any sense of these being singular. Um, and then all the facets were worked out by Richard to, in order not to create a, um, a, a, a repetition, very careful, very careful working through. Um, both were inspired by a Zoberan painting of the Vale of St. Veronica, because for Shirazi, um, the warp and the weft of the veil um, was very important as a means of conveying her imagery. So we see here in the winning design, which finally was implemented after all those permissions were gained, um, as being a metaphor for the cross, um, for a face without a face. People choose to read Christian iconography into it if they wish, um, but the artist is totally open to interpretation of any kind. Um, you see on the right, how the piece looks by night when the ellipse is very, very brilliantly lit um, from two lights either side of the sanctuary, which I think means that there should surely be time for experiment. And I think actually a company like Lignus Height would be an amazing setting for an artist in residence program so people could develop ideas in relation to your, your product. Um, for me, I think the, it's really exciting if a collaboration can start as early as possible.